Well, welcome. Welcome, everyone. I'm Gordon Gidland, president of the San Diego Shakespeare Society. And this afternoon, we have a great talk in store for you by J Professor Jonathan Shaler on the Shakespeare Prison Project. But before that, uh, I need to put in a little plug for the sponsor. The San Diego Shakespeare Society is a membership organization that's been around about 20 years. And our motto is we do Shakespeare all year round. In addition to occasional lectures like today, we have monthly open readings of the plays where anyone can join in and ham it up. We have an ongoing collaboration with the San Diego Museum of Art where we pair selected artworks with performances by talented local actors. Uh, we have had programs focusing especially on the sonnets. We have had mock trials of Shakespearean characters where real lawyers conduct uh, direct and cross-examination of the witnesses. Uh, and our flagship event is the annual Student Shakespeare Festival where kids from elementary school on up to high school act their hearts out. And of course, for every year, we've had to carry out these activities through Zoom. Uh, so we're very happy now with the reemergence of uh, re with the reemergence of public life that we have more events again in person. So if you'd like to be one of us, uh, please visit our website uh, and click on the join tab. Annual membership dues for an individual are only $35 and for a family $50. Mere pittances, moities. Um, so anyway, well now on to our show. Uh, we're so honored that Jonathan was willing to speak with us today about his work. He has been a professor of communication at the University of Wisconsin Parkside for 26 years and is the director of the Shakespeare Prison Project at the Racine Correctional Institution, in which project uh, Jonathan founded in 2004. I know the descriptions of the project stress the development of communication skills empathy, self-awareness, self-expression, and moral imagination. But also, if you watch the, the short video that accompanied the Eventbrite notice of his talk for today, he explains how the in inmates can use Shakespeare to express their own humanity. So with that wonderful guiding spirit, uh, it is obvious how important this work is. And with that, I will turn it over to Professor Shaler. Thank you very much, Gordon, and welcome everyone. It's a it's a delight to be here with you. This is a treat for me to uh, always to share something about the Shakespeare Prison Project, and I hope to not speak too long so that we can have time for a conversation. Looking forward to answering any questions you might have, or just engaging in reflection with you about this whole process. I was talking to Gordon just before we began and, and we were noting that the old globe right there in San Diego also has a, a prison project and that's a, a wonderful project. I, I know Erica Phillips, who's a coordinator of that project. And as you may know, Hyson Williams, one of the alum from our Shakespeare project here in Wisconsin is now a regular on the reflecting Shakespeare program that the Old Globe is sponsoring began when we all shut down during COVID. It was a way for them to stay connected, not only to the local prisons that they serve, but then also nicely opened things up to a larger audience. And that's, that's a wonderful program. So I just wanted to acknowledge that connection. In the short time that I have with you then, what stories can I share with you to give you a sense of the Shakespeare project? There are so many. As Gordon mentioned, we began in 2004, but the story actually begins much earlier than that. And I'm not a disinterested observer or professional director who was hired to come in and do this. I'm somebody who journeyed here myself. So maybe I should tell you a little bit about that. My interest in Shakespeare goes all the way back to a production of A Midsummer Night's Dream <laughs> that I was in in high school. I had the honor as a sophomore to play both Oberon and Theseus. That role, as you know, is often doubled. Uh, we weren't very sophisticated, so the only way 
that we used to differentiate the characters was that I had a reversible cape and that that did the trick. I doubt I did much more at that point in my career to uh, differentiate the characters. Shakespeare didn't really land in my heart or in my head at that moment. It wasn't until I was a teacher intern in Amherst, Massachusetts, when I met a remarkable man named John Warthen, a salty old guy from, he, he actually seemed old, he wasn't that old, from Georgia, who took Shakespeare with both hands and shared him with blood, sweat, and tears. And I was gripped by the way the man approached the text, the full-bodied approach that he took. Uh, he had us up on our feet speaking. And now I was his teacher intern, so I soon had to be up there with him. In fact, I remember reading scenes with him in front of the, the students, and it was, it was galvanizing. It was transformative. On a subtler note, he showed us the Grigory Kozintsev King Lear, the Russian King Lear from that time. And of course, it's uh, an epic film, a great black and white film that is so dreamlike. That's how I experienced it and brought me into a, a world that uh, let me know that there was much more to explore with, with Shakespeare. I, I didn't know about King Lear up until that moment. I thought Shakespeare was all Macbeth, Julius Caesar, Midsummer Night's Dream, but uh, things changed from that moment on. Fast forward, a uh, teaching career that took me to Jamaica for a couple of years, teaching high school drama, then grad school at UMass Amherst, where I studied communication and conflict resolution, taught for a while at Ithaca College in upstate New York, and finally landed here at the University of Wisconsin Parkside in Kenosha, Wisconsin. And in the 90s, which is when I arrived, I arrived in 94, shortly before that, uh, Racine Correctional Institution, as part of the prison building boom, had been established nearby, a medium security prison for men. And a couple of my colleagues, John Longeway and Roseanne Mason, got a Wisconsin Humanities Council grant so that we could bring college courses to the men. Pell Grants for prisoners had recently been discontinued and we saw the sharp increase in incarceration and thought we could perhaps offer something. So we did and in 1990, from 94 to 2004, so actually 95 to 2004, about 10 years, I was teaching in the, in the prison before I even touched Shakespeare in, in that venue. Uh, it was theater, however, something I call the theater of empowerment, storytelling, dialogue, and performance as a way of reflecting on our lives, exploring new possibilities for the goals of personal and, and social evolution. Very high-minded language, but I stick by that language. And we did that for, as I say, about 10 years. In 2004, the Shakespeare Prison Project was born because I met Agnes Wilcox, at a Pedagogy and Theater of the Oppressed conference in Milwaukee. Agnes Wilcox had started the Prison Performing Arts Organization in St. Louis, Missouri. And she had uh, gotten notoriety for doing Hamlet over the period of two and a half years in a prison. And that uh, ended up on Ira Glass's This American Life. So I knew of her. I had lunch with her at the conference and became so excited about this idea of doing Shakespeare in the prison. I, I, needed, we, I knew we needed to do something more, something different, not just rehearse our old personal wounds and stories, but open up new horizons. That was my feeling. And that's what Shakespeare had done for me. So thanks to Agnes, the, the Shakespeare Prison Project was born. And in fall of 2004, we began a process that has remained pretty much the same ever since nine months of study, rehearsal, dialogue, struggle, experimentation, writing, and culminating in several performances, both for inside audiences and invited audiences from the outside. We 
have involved a lot of people from the outside because one of the hidden goals of the Shakespeare project, it's not in the syllabus, is to bring in members of the community and to make the walls of the, the prison more permeable. Prisons are built not only to keep incarcerated men and women in, they're built to keep us out, to keep us separate. And to me, that seems like a mistake that we need to have more contact between the outside and the inside in order for the men in my case, and of course women who are imprisoned to have an opportunity to understand that they are still a member of society and that they have a way forward in life. I don't think that can happen very well without that kind of contact. So we've over the years brought in costumers, fight directors, actors, directors, all kinds of people. Uh, and that's been a wonderful part of the, the process. When we did Cymbeline a few years ago, a, a play that I love, and I'm, I'm really glad that we did, we actually got uh, Valerie Wayne, who edited the most recent uh, Arden edition of Cymbeline. She flew in from Hawaii and Ross King, um, a Shakespeare scholar from Great Britain, flew in over the pond. She's the, uh, the author of the only monograph on Cymbeline that I know of, scholarly monograph. And it was such a delight to have them stay at my home and then spend time with the men, sit in circle with them, talk about the character, the play, the themes, their, our process, and then of course, attend the performance itself. Uh, so there's a, a quick overview. You might be interested in, in what plays we've done. I can mention them fairly quickly. Let's see if I can rattle them off. King Lear, pretty much in order. King Lear, Othello, The Tempest, Julius Caesar. I pause here because we had a break when my son Isaac was born, went away for a few years and then came back, not without a little bit of trouble because uh, the warden at that time wasn't particularly interested in the heavy lift that the Shakespeare project had turned out to be from a security viewpoint. And so there was some resistance at first. I had to knock on the door a few times in order to get back in. Uh, there was a change in some admi in administrative leadership. And so that, that helped open up a, an avenue. And um, our next play coming back in was Hamlet. Then we went to A Midsummer Night's Dream, The Merchant of Venice, Cymbeline, Measure for Measure. We also did uh, a series of scenes and soliloquies, a, a kind of variety production. Interwoven with all of that have been uh, productions that we call Shakespeare's Mirror, which are the personal stories of the men themselves inspired by their work with Shakespeare, by themes, by issues that characters face in the plays. And these creative uh, performances are also an offering now that we have as, as part of the project. We, we did shut down during COVID and I'm excited to come back uh, in, in September. The, the rough plan right now is to do a series of scenes and soliloquies based on the theme of justice. I was inspired by Kenji Yoshino's book, A Thousand Times More Fair, what Shakespeare plays teach us about justice and he deals with nine plays. We probably won't do that many, <laughs> but he begins with Titus Andronicus and goes through an arc of development, more and more sophisticated and refined ideas of justice, ending with perhaps not surprisingly, The Tempest. But I thought it might be an interesting journey to, to explore characters and, and scenes from those plays. We'll see, it's always an organic process. So that's the overview. I also wanted to dip into uh, a particular man's story. And so if you'll forgive me, I'm gonna read a bit. I need to call that up on my screen. This is Peter, I'll call him. Actually, um, that's a pseudonym. And uh, he wrote in his journal about his father at one point in his work he wrote, Thanksgiving 1998. It was the first time I had seen my dad in a long time. He made a disrespectful comment towards me. I approached him. He hit me. 
I froze up. I felt shock, disbelief. I thought, I can't believe my dad hit me. I was hurt, scared. I felt minuscule, insignificant. I thought, I wish he would have never come back. When I first met Peter, he was 28, a lanky young man with a sensitive face, a gentle voice, and a haunted look in his eyes. He was one of 14 incarcerated men who had volunteered to participate in a produ production of The Tempest at Racine Correctional Institution. Peter had chosen to play the role of Ferdinand, the young nobleman who vies for the affections of Miranda, Prospero's only child. And yes, the men largely do choose their own roles. For most of the play, Ferdinand has a troubled relationship with Prospero, his future father-in-law. It's probably not coincidental that Peter's relationship with his real father was also troubled. While Prospero temporarily adopts a stern facade in order to bring out Ferdinand's best qualities, Peter's father neglected and bullied him throughout his life. The incident which begins this little talk is Peter's recollection of one particularly painful incident. We sometimes say in the Shakespeare project that the roles choose the men. Peter told us that he looked for some way to act out his anger, some way to show himself and his father that he was somebody. Eventually he joined a gang. Then one night with two accomplices, he robbed a restaurant at knife point, bound the two employees with duct tape. Peter was found guilty on multiple charges, including armed robbery and kidnapping. He was sentenced to 30 years. He entered a prison at the age of 19, and as he explains, he grew up there. While the harsh environment and the general inhumanity of prison life had the potential to further crush Peter's spirit and perhaps make of him yet another career criminal, he focused on reducing his time behind bars in order to be with his daughter, who was conceived before he was incarcerated and born only a few months after. While Peter participated in every correctional program that he could, two in particular stand out as especially significant for him. The first was a victim awareness program that he participated in about three years after he began to serve his time. The second program that made a big difference was the Shakespeare Prison Project, which he joined about four years later. As Peter puts it, he had already demonstrated to himself and others that he was capable of empathy, remorse, and remediation. Shakespeare, he says, offered something more. He says, before I had always been trying to fit into some image of what I thought people wanted me to be, the Shakespeare Project was a chance for me to say, this is who I am. For nine months, Peter worked closely with other prisoners and with several volunteer teachers and artists in addition to playing the role of Ferdinand, his first opportunity ever to act in a play, Peter helped to compose an original score and played in the pit band. On the night of our public performance, Peter's mother and sisters were there. So was his seven-year-old daughter, who had not seen him in over two years. Since the actors were in costume, it was the first time in her life that she had seen Peter in any other clothing other than prison greens. His performance was radiant. At the end of the show, the actors had the opportunity to mingle and greet the audience members. Peter's mother and sisters were beaming and wiping the tears from their eyes. He was unsure how his daughter would react. He stepped toward her and opened his arms. She ran into them and he held her. It felt like only a moment he wrote, but it felt eternal, the most beautiful moment I have ever known. When somebody nearby asked her what she thought of her daddy up there on stage, she beamed and exclaimed, my daddy is a prince. Now, today, 14 years later, Peter has been out of prison for 10 years. He has maintained a close relationship with his daughter. He's married and he has a really good job. Looking back at the Shakespeare project, he describes it as a critically important moment in his
preparation for release. He says, it gave me a renewed sense of life. It was kind of a coming out for me. He says the most valuable aspect of the program was that it showed him that there are other things out there in life. The world is huge. There are healthy, productive things to do in life. So there's one story. I hesitate to name this guy because I'm, I'm dealing with both pseudonyms and, and real names. And some of these guys are out in the media. We've gotten some media coverage. In particular, this young man who is called Peter. <laughs> um, actually, I can tell you his real name because he's out and he's been in the media. His name is Nick. And Nick came to, after he got out of prison, came to the university a couple of times and gave talks to my students and to the public at large at the University of Wisconsin Parkside. And uh, he also attended uh, a national conference with us. So there's something about the after incarceration period that has been also meaningful to several of our participants. We mentioned Hyson Williams earlier, uh, mentioning Nick now. There are a few others who, after they, they got out, got in touch with me and wanted to do something. The Shakespeare Project was kind of a bridge for them in their re-entry to the, to the community. Uh, Hyson is kind of unique in, in the amount of energy and, and stick to that he's had in terms of wanting to be a performer. But all of them have, um, to some extent, of, of these several that I'm mentioning, found the bridge effect, if you will call, want to call it that, to be something um, that's been helpful to them in their re-entry into society. Given that there are so many stories, I was wondering what would be most impactful in this short period that we have together. And I'm always torn about showing video because video kind of carries us away, but it can, it can also give us a real taste. And I, I'm landing on the side of showing a little bit of video today. So what I, what I wanna show you is a kind of slick uh, trailer that I put together for our production of A Midsummer Night's Dream. You might recognize the iMovie production values. <laughs> and after that, a, uh, some brief testimony from the men who are part of that project, what, why it was meaningful to them, how it was meaningful to them, what they took away from it. And I think after that, that might be a good time to begin to engage in conversation. So let, let's try that if, you're, if that sounds good to you. <clears throat> I'm going to uh, go to screen share. Hopefully this will work. You never know, right? I do have the capacity, so let's see if my screen is up. Um, Google Chrome. Okay, something a little funky going on here. Just take a moment. Google Chrome. I do not want that window. Let's try this window. Ah, where are you, Google Chrome? Okay, this should work. I have to restart. Am I still here? Yes. Okay, share screen. Here it is. A Midsummer Night's Dream was our production in 2016.
Okay. Oops, I don't want to replay it. Help. <laughs> okay, I want to get out of there. And this is, these are the reflections. I am a Shakespearean actor. I, I tried to do something in high school, but I was just awkward. And I thought this was great because it gave me a platform to get to know people and, and be comfortable with who I am. And it was, it was great knowing that other people were in the same boat, that they wanted to get to know other people and get comfortable with themselves. And it was nice to um, see what hidden talents I had. And I thought it was really fun to be able to express myself and to find uh, ranges of emotion that I never knew I had. And I don't know, I'm glad it's here. I really glad, I'm glad that we have this experience and uh, I'm, I'm thankful for the Park State University. I'm thankful for this institution for allowing this. And yeah, this definitely changed me. And um, it made me more, I don't want to say assertive, but it made me more um, proud to be who I am at the core of who I am. And I think that I love um, knowing these guys and the fact that anybody can do this is pretty cool. Shakespeare posits a lot of strange interactions between a variety of different types of people. And I think by doing that, it sort of lays everything out there. There's really no experience that I don't think that Shakespeare hasn't addressed in some way, shape or form, whether it's issues of jealousy or conceit or I, I, there are so many complexities to his stories. And I think to be able to act those out is very therapeutic. Having gone through this class exposed me to another side of uh, rehabilitation. This play is all about relationships and building relationships. Getting used to being around other people and seeing how they act towards people's feedback and decisions. Over my uh, course of my long stay in prison, I've been involved in quite a few programs, but none of them have ever taught me how to relate to people. And so now I'm learning how to relate with people. A lot of this has been more about relationship building and uh, developing tolerance, patience with other people and with myself. Well, it's been a lot of learning about myself, first of all, because I'm playing the role of a woman, something that in the past I had always thought that and never thought I would do. Um, the idea kind of horrified me, actually. But uh, after considering it and deciding that I really needed to take a risk and step out of my comfort zone, I did that. And I've actually been learning a little bit about how to relate to that side of myself, because everyone does have a feminine side. Uh, and uh, I've been learning a lot about how to get along with people. Well, as we begin to read the play, and some ideas jump out there, but really seeing my other fellow actors, just really digging to them and listening to the way that they bounce the lines off one another. And it got me thinking a little more in depth, like some aspects of the play, like uh, it seems like uh, the Italian opera had the power to sway or to will the events or future events that may have happened. They willed the way. They said, we're going to be there for the way. But yet, it didn't even come out of Theseus' mouth yet. So I was like, whoa, I didn't catch it. In the midst of acting scenes, read through the script, talked through them, but really hit me then. Another one well was Hermia, my character. And nowhere in the world, I got a love interest. And they gonna act crazy, and then we gonna wake up the next day, and I'm just gonna be okay with that. I wanna know what's going on. If we get married, will this happen a little later down the line in the future? What cause is? The goal I originally started out with was to take advantage of the, the credits offered through the program. Um, so that gets me close to my bachelor's degree. And I didn't expect much beyond that. Um, given the group is largely made up of people that I hadn't associated with before, I was surprised that the group came together fairly well. I played Hippoly Hippolyta and Titania in Shakespeare's play, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. I first came to this play thinking it was something else. I thought it was something to do with critical thinking. I thought it was a group where you would get some certificate, you know, uh, be taught to think differently uh, 
see the world a better way, uh, resolve your problems better. And it turned out to be Shakespeare. Well, <clears throat> my people, they like to question, you know, the people they meet, uh, events, uh, sightings, dreams. And so I wondered if there was a greater reason why I came that day. And I sat through it, I listened, I thought about it, and I wanted to see if there was a greater reason. I wanted to see if there was more meaning and why it was that I found myself here at orientation that day. And so through the process, I've met different kinds of characters, of people that I would normally not associate with or hang out with. Um, but through Shakespeare, and the way Doc Shaler teaches the class, the theater, I was able to, to get out of my comfort zone. I was able to view people better without coloring them with my uh, discrimination, with my prejudice. Uh, uh, it helped me to find my humanity, uh, my true self. Uh, so it was everything that I thought it was, except for the theater. And for that, I thank Doc and I thank Shakespeare for being the great playwright. And uh, I'm glad I stayed in them. I'm glad I committed myself to it. Thank you. There we go. Make sure that uh, I'm back on. So that in a nutshell is an introduction to the Shakespeare Prison Project in Wisconsin. As you may know, there are similar programs elsewhere in the country. The most famous perhaps being Kurt Toftlin's uh, program that began in Kentucky. He's now in Michigan where he has, is doing his own thing. Uh, but the Kentucky program continues. There's a famous documentary, Shakespeare Behind Bars, which if you haven't seen, I highly recommend. And there's now something called the Shakespeare Prison, Shakespeare in Prison Network, or the Prison Shakespeare Network, that's it. We've been an organization for uh, some years now. Uh, we've had a conference in San Diego. We've had, I think, two or three others at this point. We get together on average every couple of years. Detroit has a great program. Um, they're currently working on a, an edited edition of Richard III, which will be fully annotated, annotated by uh, the stories and observations of the incarcerated actors. And I could go on, but that's just to give you a taste that we're part of a larger community. Uh, just a, one last bit, which I just find kind of fascinating, given that we uh, dealt with COVID over the last year. While uh, I was waiting to get back into Racing Correctional Institution, uh, I scratched my Shakespeare itch with my fellow prison Shakespeare facilitators by reading over 20 unabridged uh, Shakespeare plays on Zoom. I know you folks do that, too. We, we went at quite a clip starting in, I think, April of 2020, and on average doing it every week um, throughout the summer and into the fall. Uh, and it involved not only prison Shakespeare facilitators, but former members of our programs, uh, people who had been released from prison. And uh, even my 12-year-old son got to play puck. So uh, it was a wonderful kind of coming together. You never know what's going to happen in a, in a dark time. Sometimes magical things do happen. On that note, I would thank you for your attention. And uh, let's have a conversation about this. Comments, questions? I would love to see some faces. If anybody's willing to turn on their camera. Hi. Hello. <laughs> uh, can I say something? Please. Or... Please. <laughs> okay, Jonathan, I love that. 
it brought me back. Um, I'm retired technically, I put it in quotes because you don't ever really retire from a calling like this, but I was a music therapist. So I know the wonder of using something so fundamental as music or as acting or something, dancing and watching with total wonder what it brings out in people, mm. their strengths, their humor, their insights in people mm. that no one had ever thought could possibly have them. I work with people with mild to severe intellectual handicaps and of course mm. consequent physical limitations I came with them. And I have goosebumps just talking mm about it. Yours was just as magic. I felt that same power. Mm. And thank you for the presentation and for bringing it to my attention. Oh, thank you. Uh, sounds like you're doing wonderful work. The um, What kind of thing do you do with your folks? Well, I did. I did. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I did a lot of improvisation mm. on instruments percussion instruments, depending on their abilities too. Sometimes I use the instruments in conjunction with physiotherapists mm. just to help them stretch out a bit because they really want to hit that instrument or they have a tambourine and it would make a sound when they move, no matter how convulsively that was mm. to them. Very neat because it reflected them in a way. Mm -hmm. um, movement was very, very fundamental to me. Always very important to grow it no matter how slight into whatever that person or group of people could do. Mm. I use singing a lot. They love singing. Um, everyone responded to the traditional childhood songs for mm. certain. And if they were able, if they were verbal and were able to sort of conceptualize a little, I would have them fill in, fill in the verses. So if we did row, row, row your boat, it turned into, well, where would you like your boat to take you? Mm. What would you like to do? You know, and we went like that. Or if, Beautiful. you know, um, the one about, um, oh, the one about Johnny, Johnny's going off to the store and not coming back. Well, what would you have liked at the store? What would you like him to bring you from the store? And mm -hmm. you've got a glimpse into their personalities. No one thought they had personalities to get a glimpse into. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So Wonderful. It was exciting. Yeah. Oh, that's really lovely. That, that's really lovely. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, Is your, your name Sara or Sabra? I, my eyes aren't great. Sara. Sara. Yeah. Thank you, Sara. Yeah, I, I'll just want, as, as a tie into what you were saying, the uh, the abilities of the men in the Shakespeare project are varied. The level of education, uh, the ability to uh, cognitively process, and uh, we accommodate everyone. Uh, we don't we don't turn anyone away. No. Yeah. Well, Jonathan, there's a one question in the chat about the running lengths of the shows. And, and oh, yes. Okay. And did the inmates help in your own editing? Okay. Oh, right. Of the play. Uh, yes. So the, the usual running time was about two and a half hours of a play, which, you know, always does involve some cutting, obviously. And uh, yes, we did have discussions about where the cuts would be. And uh, sometimes very passionate <laughs> discussions <laughs> about what line or word must not be cut. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm not sure what else to say about that at the, at the moment, but um, that's uh, two and a half hours. And which is, a, we have, I had mixed feelings about that because I always like time for conversation. And given the, the constraints of the prison environment, that didn't leave a lot of time for. A, discussion with the audience. It always felt a little bit pressured. We had, if we went to two and a half hours, we had at the maximum uh, 30 minutes to talk with the audience, which never seemed like enough. <clears throat> Thank you, Becky. Um, so I, that was my question and I have another uh, one. Uh -huh. How long was your like class or rehearsal process? 
Mm -hmm. How long was that period duration? Yes. Sure. Uh, thank you. The the process would start in September, first week of September, sometimes a little earlier, sometimes a little later, about then. And then the, the production would come off in May, April, May, or June, <laughs> somewhere in there, most, most often May. We met every Tuesday. At, we, I, say, I say it in past tense. I shouldn't say that. That's too pessimistic. We, met, we meet every Tuesday mm -hmm. and Thursday uh, from 6 to 8 or 8.30. That's a so, big commitment. Yeah, it is a big commitment. I, the one year that I tried cutting back and doing it only once a week, something was lost. Uh, mm -hmm. Momentum and development that I'd become familiar with. And so once a week was not was not enough. Uh, and then during the final month of rehearsals, um, four or five or six times a week, uh, we, we, you know, because we put up full productions, costumes, music, the, the, the whole nine yards. The thanks to, um, well, it's a long story, but I'll just say that we now have a stage that uh, an, an anonymous donor, um, someone who wishes to remain anonymous, family foundation from Chicago uh, gave us $20,000 so that we could purchase a real stage, uh, you know, a, a really strong functional set of platforms. And uh, so that's now what we use. I'm curious, like when you first started to rehearse, mm -hmm. um, did you have to do a lot of explanation to the men about what it was about, deal with any mm -hmm. fear or hesitation? Like, how did it start? Because mm -hmm. exactly. that must be some process. Yeah, well, we sit in circle. It's a very uh, friendly, welcoming environment. We play games. We do a lot of uh, theater games and exercises. Um, I teach them about iambic pentameter, you know. Mm -hmm. I say it's like the rhythm of your heartbeat. And we, we start with that. We, uh, I give them some lines to, to work with right away and we all work on them together. Mm -hmm. I, use actually, this will sound a little nerdy, but uh, Scott Kaiser, uh, the former Oregon Shakespeare Festival um, voice director, wrote a marvelous book called, um, I should remember it, Mastering Shakespeare. And he, he breaks down the process of tackling the performance of a, of a monologue or a scene into seven steps. Wow. Uh, yeah. And they're very clear and they're very sound. I mean, anybody who has had acting experience would recognize those steps. Uh, but he, he, he does it so well. And in, in relation to Shakespeare's language, it, it, you know, begins with um, <clears throat> recognizing speech measures where a thought begins and where it ends, not necessarily at the end of a line. Um, recognizing key words that some words d deserve more strength and, and emphasis than others because they're operative, they carry the energy of the mm -hmm. speech. So making that distinction, knowing what your intention is. He, he uses different language, but that's the gist of it. Uh, visualizing, for example, if you're uh, Gertrude speaking about Ophelia's drowning, actually visualizing that as you speak, uh -huh. picking a focal point and working mm -hmm. through that process, but always knowing your focal point where your attention is directed, uh, working with physical actions that express the intent of, of the speech, and then weaving all of these, I don't know if I got through all seven, but that's the, the idea, then weaving, of course, all of these together in performance. And so uh, that really carried concrete. them, that really helped. Sorry? It's very concrete, which must be reassuring. Very concrete. I was just rereading some of their journals uh, in preparation for today's talk. And one of the guys mentioned that one of the most useful exercises to him was where you, you 
you read through the scene in Shakespeare's language, you get the idea of what's happening. Um, you, you break it down line by line so you understand the meaning of every word. Uh, but then to act out the scene without Shakespeare's language, to hit the same beats, the same, uh -huh. uh, to follow, pursue the same objectives, but in ordinary language and mm -hmm. to improvise that. Um, but to get through the scene that way was mm -hmm. very useful. Yeah. That's amazing. It's fun. Uh, <laughs> Jonathan, one question I had, and, and Jonathan and I were speaking before, before we started a little bit, there's a, a practitioner in Indiana who, uh, named Laura Bates who works in high security mm -hmm. facilities, I understand. She wrote a book called How Shakespeare Saved My Life. Mm -hmm. And I recommend that to anyone who's interested in this subject. But in, in, in listening to you, Jonathan, it's so obvious you, you have a very altruistic, dedicated um, perspective. It, it, you know, I love, especially the line you were saying earlier about making the prison walls permeable. I think that, that is so, so critical. But it's funny, in uh, Laura's book, and um, uh, she's mm -hmm. very candid about this, there's very, one very interesting part where she had a group and she assigned them Macbeth. Mm. And then she and she said, like, frankly, I assigned that because I wanted to hear how authentic was Macbeth's murder of Duncan. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I was just, I was just wondering, and I, that's something I would think too. And but I was just wondering, is there a, 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 a tendency or a concern or a tension you may have to worry about that? okay, these, I'm helping these people. I'm not an anthropologist sort of studying them. Right, and right. I mean, have you run into that? I mean, you know, you know what she, the insights she came up with were amazing. And I, I, I think of that when I was listening to that, mm. that little video of the men speaking of this, uh, but, but I mean, is that something that we have to, you have to kind of worry about? And the worry would be what exactly? Well, I mean, it, it's almost like I, I, I don't want to use, you know, the word like you're, you're studying a, a, a tribe in New Guinea. Now, how do I they see. do these things or something, mm. right? Yeah, I, 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 I hate to use the word, you know, they used to say rich right. people used to go slumming where, you know, they'd go and look, go, how does the other half live, you know, right. rather than really helping them or, you know, worrying, you know, remembering the focus is on them, the focus yeah. is on them. You know, I, yeah, I, I have I have not done I have not taken that line of inquiry that that uh, that Laura Bates has taken, but I am interested in how all of us um, make sense of our lives and uh, as performers of everyday life, and how the arts can contribute to our personal growth. So, including myself in that, not seeing the the prisoners as a species apart, um, I I'm curious about how we all learn and grow together. Now, obviously, the prison context is extraordinary, and there are extraordinary issues that we have to to deal with. So, I'm not trying to hide from your question. I'm just trying to think about the best way to uh, approach it. I've, I've gotten pushback, for example, when I say, we're going we're gonna, you know, to learn about empathy. <laughs> and one of the guys says to me, do you think we don't know what empathy is? You, do you think we're not capable of empathy? Who do you think we are? You know, do you think we're animals? And um, it's a valid question. Uh, these guys uh, don't want to be talked down to. They are human beings. And so, um, and yet I do have a comeback to that. And my comeback is, uh, I think we could all use a little work with empathy. And uh, I'm, I'm right here with you. And um, I, I find that literature in general, Shakespeare in particular, has expanded my horizons in terms of understanding human behavior, human feelings, needs, perspectives. Uh, it's enriched me. And, and that's why I, I want to bring this gift to you, because I, I, I think you will benefit from it as well. All right, I could go on. It, oh, and I also too, if I, I don't want to make it sound like I, I, no. I did, I'm against the approach Laura Bates took, mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. I mean, I, if I could share this with the group too, I thought it was amazing. 
when she was doing Macbeth, and also she was working with a group, you're not talking about high school dropouts. Maybe you're talking about grade school dropouts. I mean, these the fellows had simply no background. And it was amazing what she was able to approach them with and tell them the story. And But it was so interesting. You know, Not only she, she asked about, well, the authenticity of this murder, but then she explained, you know, it's always confusing to people when Macbeth, after he kills Duncan and the groomsmen, he comes back with the knives. And then Lady Macbeth yells at him, what are you, why are you doing that? And then she takes them back. Well, one of the, one of the inmates said, well, there, he did that, he did it on purpose. He wants her in on the crime. And, and they said, from their perspective, you can't, it's hard to do a crime alone. And, you know, and this is something like, wow, I guess I never thought of that. You know, and mm -hmm. that as well is amazing. One particular mm -hmm. student she worked with, she, he was analyzing the, um, the spells the witches came up with mm -hmm. and said, gee, is she, are they trying to put together a complete animal? Mm -hmm. And Laura said, I, I've never heard that in any scholarly mm -hmm. discussion of, you know, how, how somebody who really is coming into this so uh, fresh without any, any preconceptions says, oh, let me, let me study this. And it, 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 but anyway, I guess what Jonathan, my point is, it's a gift they give us too. I'm a gift of this yes. perspective. Yes. It, along those lines, you might've heard one of my actors, uh, who played Hermia say, I'm not just going to wake up after all that craziness and say, hey, I'm cool with you guy. Everything's all right. <laughs> We're just going to get married and it's going to be fine from here on in. <laughs> we have some things to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think their life experience, which has been in many ways radically different from ours and in many ways like ours, has taught them a lot that allows them to see, to perceive, and to be very perceptive of certain aspects of Shakespeare that we perhaps are not as much. Mm -hmm. And to see them from a slant and an empathy that we perhaps don't have because mm -hmm. of our lives, yeah. which are quite sheltered compared yeah. to the lives I would think that most of these people led. And another thing too, I was thinking um, from my own, I'm sorry, I'm really hogging if anyone wants to, <laughs> but you cannot go anywhere into any environment and assume right. that people are going to be this way or that way or the other way, that everybody who is, has a certain degree of intellectually, intellectual handicap is going to be this way. Someone else is going to be that way. Someone profoundly, profoundly physically disabled can suddenly run away. I mean, right. You cannot assume. You have to meet everybody where they are because yes. assumption is dangerous. I don't want, and absolutely, thank you for that. I, I want to say also that I don't want to romanticize and I don't want to skirt the question of, you know, what issues keep coming up again and again with, with these men, with this population. So violence as a viable alternative sometimes mm -hmm. the first alternative in a stressful situation. You know, it's intimidate or be intimidated. Uh, we had an incident when we were doing Othello, the guy who was playing Desdemona was watching himself on film. We, we did rushes sometimes, like look at yourself on film. And he uh, was very nervous looking at himself playing Desdemona and uh, the, I, I don't know what he did. Uh, he was just sit, seated watching it. Another guy who was kind of a wise guy um, for reasons beyond me, decided to push the lever underneath uh, Desdemona's chair. It was an adjustable chair, which suddenly sent him boom, down plunging suddenly. Oh, no. And he was up on his feet in an instant and they were facing off with each other. I made the mistake I was told later of getting in between them. The, the men told me never do that again because it's too dangerous. Uh, you know, when, when, when something's on like that, you don't do that. So I appreciated the feedback, but at the moment it's what I did instinctively and 
we were in a holding pattern for a moment and two of the men in the cast intervened. Um, Matt and Haisan of all people, <laughs> he keeps coming up. And they took the men aside. Each one of them had a private chat with them in a different part of the library, which is where we were rehearsing. And after both men had an opportunity to cool down through those conversations, we all came together and we processed further as a large group. Uh, Larry, who'd been playing Desdemona, got an apology from James. James, you know, we, we talked him through, you know, what were you doing and, uh, you know, boundaries not appropriate and all that sort of thing, never going to happen again. Uh, so we have those experiences. And one reason I mentioned that one to you uh, is that the men were particularly proud of that story. And when I asked them at the end of the year of, of Othello, you know, what was the, the most memorable moment? A lot of them said that moment because they had handled their own conflict successfully mm -hmm. without the intervention of guards. If that had happened anywhere else in the prison, you know, probably mm -hmm. two people would have ended up in solitary confinement. But it didn't because we were in a kind of sanctuary, a place where they can take more risks for good or for ill and work through things in a more organic mm -hmm. way. Uh, so I just wanted to share that with you. That's pretty incredible. You must have had immense trust in them to sit back and allow that. And, and well, not they, I, Unless I wasn't, you were I would have been yeah. still, yeah. I wasn't sitting back. <laughs> to let the process, in yeah. that way, rather yeah. than take the easy way and call it guard. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, we did have a guard come in at, at, at one point. I, I drew a line when, um, you know, I've mentioned violence as an issue. Uh, sex offenses are uh, a sign of an inability to uh, deal with a lot of stuff, including boundaries, intimacy, uh, sexual urges, etc. cetera. And um, <clears throat> so we've had a fair number. It's just given the prison population of men who's uh, not only violent offenders, but also sex offenders. And one guy, when I brought some of my students from the university um, and we, we were doing some exercises, managed to have a one-on-one, -on -one, which I would, you know, I learned from that experience never to allow that to happen again. Uh, and he uh, asked, told her that he uh, would like to know when her birthday is so he could send her a birthday card and what was her address and that sort of thing. So I, um, I found out about that because at the end of the session, she came up to me in tears and told me about it. She was shaken. I uh, had a long conversation with her uh, about it um, and we decided to redraw boundaries so that wouldn't happen again. She decided she was okay with coming back into the prison because we, we had a couple of follow-up sessions, but she was had permission to not come back in and not lose any credit as a result. But she, she managed, and I'm glad she did, to come back in. Um, and for that guy, I wrote him up. Now there's where I'm on the side of, of the prison administration. If somebody um, violates a boundary so wantonly and affects, in this case, my students. I wrote him up. Um, I um, I just had zero tolerance for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a strange occurrence when he was taken out of the project because um, the, at the next rehearsal, this was during the Tempest, the men um, had were having a grand old time. Ferdinand. The guy named Nick I mentioned earlier uh, was stripped down to the waist naked because that's how we were doing it. That scene with him carrying the wood, like uh, topless Ferdinand, you know, muscular Ferdinand, and uh, one of the guy, other guys in the cast was kind of like had a crush on him, um, and the uh, so you know we had a laugh about all of that. 
but I was writing my notes uh, while they were, uh, we were taking a break from the work and I looked up and three other actors had taken their shirts off and they had all linked arms and they were doing a chorus line and they were doing it for my benefit. It was a prank and I thought it was hilarious. But at that very moment, talk about bad timing, two guards entered the room oh, no. to take away the guy who had uh, violated a boundary with my student. So they ended up um, putting him in shackles, but like their jaws dropped, they're looking around and it, the only thing they were able to say was, looks like we might have to be taking out a few other people here, but uh, they didn't. And that was the end of the, the incident. That, I don't know what that captures exactly. It's just a remarkable moment about, talk about dealing with boundaries. What, how far we can go in being playful and expressive and experimental and where there are clear boundaries, I guess. Mm -hmm. It's hard. Yeah. So um, just want to make sure. Yeah, uh, KP had a question, Jonathan, about how the community reacted to yes. this. Mm -hmm. Um, for the, for the most part, uh, very warmly and, uh, w with fascination, we, we, we brought, um, members of the community and there's a Green Bay, Wisconsin Shakespeare Society that had caught wind of our work and they came to our productions for several years in a row. They, they drove three hours to our campus or, or to the prison, um, watched the, the two and a half hour production and then drove three hours back, uh, which was quite a bit of dedication on their part. Uh, although the, you know, there are naysayers and I would, I would hear them occasionally in a, there would be a chat uh, or a thread, comment thread on an article or once when I was being interviewed, somebody, the, the biggest challenge I ever got was somebody calling up when I was being interviewed by Jean Faraka on Wisconsin Public Radio and she said, uh, it's wonderful that you're doing this with these men. It's wonderful they have an opportunity to do this. But my father was murdered. And the men um, who, who did this are in prison. And the idea of them having a good old time, putting on a play, no. Um, and uh, I, I had to really find some way to ad address that. So what I first said was I was so sorry, of course, about what happened to her father. I shared that I had experienced a, the violent death of somebody who was close to me, a girlfriend who had been murdered, who had been abducted, raped and murdered brutally. Um, and um, regarding what I'm doing with prisoners right now, it's um, a discrete function. When men are incarcerated, people are incarcerated, they are being punished. That is the punishment. And to, uh, to offer an opportunity for, to be more human, to do something that socializes you is only to the benefit of us because most people who are incarcerated, even murderers, do get out at some point. They do get out at some point. And is it better if they're stewing in, the, in their cell? Uh, you know, it's tempting to think that a, a kind of, I'll use the word, sadistic idea of torture or incarceration as, as, a, as a punishment and along the lines of torture is the right way to go, to really bear down. Um, but it's not, it's, it's just not. All the evidence shows that that doesn't work. All the evidence shows that that, that doesn't work. So yeah. that, was, that was my answer, yeah. Jonathan, yeah. You don't get to this if you don't want to, because it's intensely personal. Mm -hmm. How were you able to move from your girlfriend dying in that violent way to being able to go to a prison hmm. and work with these men? Well, it was partly compartmentalization. I compartmentalized. 
Mm -hmm. But at some point I did share with the men that experience. It was relevant. It wasn't gratuitous. There was some reason I, I brought it up. I had written a poem about it. I shared it with the men. Uh, and it, it led to a very um, deep conversation about victims and perpetrators and empathy. In the poem, what I had tried to do was to take the perspective, not only of Helene and her parents and her loved ones, but also of the murderer and his parents and the detective and on and on uh, to do a broad view of, of everyone, the ripple effect as they call it. Mm -hmm. By the way, just a footnote on this, because it was, if you ever are interested in the case, there's a Dateline NBC episode on it. I think it's called A Promise to Helene. That's, that's, the, that's the girl. And I'm in the documentary, so is my sister. Um, what's remarkable about it, the reason it made, uh, I guess, Dateline NBC is because the murder took place in 19, January of 1980, they found the guy in December of 2020, 40 years later. Yeah. So uh, DNA and um, genealogical analysis is what led them to him. That's a little bit of a rabbit hole, but I thought I would. <laughs> You could ask me, would I do Shakespeare with that guy? Uh, the answer is no, too close to home. <laughs> right. Yeah. I think you're a very extraordinary person that you could write a poem like that. My role model was Thich Nhat Hanh. Uh, who wrote a poem called Me By My True Names. I highly recommend it. Uh, if, you, if you look at that poem, I used it as a model. I used the structure of his poem as a model. It's Call Me By My True Names. Well, uh, this has been amazing, uh, just incredible. Um, I, I, I speak for everyone. I'm sure that this has just been a fabulous, fabulous talk, Jonathan. I mean, w does anyone else have any parting thoughts? Um, just tremendous, and I hope I hope it does um, inspire us all to consider this issue more of how you know these kinds of projects they are so so important, uh, despite is there, there could be some pushback as, as Jonathan mentioned that, you know, why, why, how can you be doing this? So, but, uh, but it's a, you make, Jonathan makes a, an amazing case, so. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. All right, well, if there's nothing, uh, yeah, again, um, um, if you'd like to be one of us, uh, <laughs> look at our, our website, San Diego Shakespeare Society. And again, uh, Jonathan, thank you so much. Thank you. This has been absolutely fabulous. A pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.